Just add the, uh, you know, the cochlear, the nucleus and the cochlear, but you're looking at the brain stem. So you have to focus on the brain stem and obviously make sure that there's no other uh, anomaly in the intercranial region. Um, so the surgery is, uh, is uh, in the sorry. The surgery in a child uh, is, is definitely a much bigger procedure compared to a cochlear implant. It takes about three hours, three, three and a half hours, and if you add the time that you need for intraoperative uh, electrophysiology, that takes another hour of things. So, so totally about four and a half hours is about the average time that you do. So you let out the, you open the dura, and open the cisterns, let out the CSR, and the cerebral limb will retract nicely. So once the cerebral limb retracts, you give the sector of the low cranial nerves, and that's the choroid plexus, which you can see is coming up. And you can already see the, the ninth cranial nerve towards the right, <coughs> and the facial nerve on the left side, and see the, the IFA loop. And uh, now then we dissect out the choroid plexus, open up and then you introduce your implant. And from now on it's, it's more the surgeon's tactile perception because you really can't see how much you're going to go. So you push it in as much as you can and stop when you feel resistance. So that's the, uh, the actual procedure. And then you put, a, put, a, put in a bit of sound tissue to stabilize it because the brain, you know, remember, is a pulsatile organ. The, next to the heart, it's the most pulsatile organ of the body. It tends to pulsate and it tends to push out anything that you put in normally. So you have to stabilize it to keep it in position. So intraoperative monitoring, I won't go into detail because Ranjit just covered it quite extensively this morning, you know, and we rely quite heavily on the input from the audiologist you know, intraoperatively. If he tells us which are the electrodes which are auditory, which are the electrodes which are non-auditory, how good is the response is, is the contact good, you know, so so much of information we get intraoperatively from the audiologist. And this is one situation where you better listen to your audiologist. You really have to listen to them. And if Ranjit says, no, I'm not happy, then you know, we, we just say, okay, so what do you want us to do? They take it out, put it back in, you know, we put it back in. If he says, push it in more, we push it in more. He says, pull it out, we pull it out. We do exactly whatever he says. You know, it's like, like taming the monkey, you know. The, we are the monkeys in that instance. So he just tells us what to do and we do it. No questions asked. Absolutely. Because the audiologist is, has the advantage that he's actually looking at the response. Because the surgeon is only manipulating the device, you know, so we are very clear on that account. And this is a complete teamwork. And, and uh, sometimes, you know, he will tell us, okay, that's fine, I think this is about the best we're going to get. You guys pull up, then we say thank you very much, sir, and we go out. And so that's how it works. So we're very, very clear uh, on those, you know, uh, that relationship. This is a definitely a, a teamwork. And so it heavily relies on the intraoperative monitoring and has to rely on the, uh, the feedback that he gets from the audiologist. Uh, switch on is usually done uh, about six weeks. I think now or I think it's going after four weeks, I think, uh, because we, we need to give time for healing in the back step. So it's longer than uh, the cochlear implant. So usually about four to six weeks, I think. And when he switches on, he does it in the uh, critical care unit with the anesthetist standby, uh, full facilities for uh, uh, cardiac resuscitation. Because when you're stimulating, you could be stimulating all the wrong neighbors. You remember, it's a very important VIP neighborhood. You don't want to be stimulating the wrong guys, uh, and it's quite possible. So you're looking for non-auditory, or rather Ajit is looking for non-auditory stimulus. It's much more difficult in a child, you know, and you look for tingling, you look for chittering of the visual field, Unwanted motor responses, uh, uh, 
vestibular stimulation and so on. Most of we do a, a CT to make sure that everything is in position. And so that's done usually uh, a couple of days after the surgery. So does it work? Okay, so this is uh, Justin. Uh, point, point, volume. Three, four, four five, five, six, six seven. seven. What's important is that ah, ah, ah. Because that tells you there's prosody. And that's the important thing. Because that tells you that he's got auditory feedback. And that he's listening to his own speech. What you think. And that's the best indication to say that this is working. He's hearing. With the device. So this is it. Now, we, we don't expect, as Rajesh said in the morning, we don't expect a brain stem implant to be doing as well as a boxer implant, not at all. And in fact, it's very unfair to compare apples with oranges. You know, we are, what we're seeing is is this going to be better? Is he going to be better with the implant rather than without the implant? And he's going to be better. That, that much we are sure about. So, I think the comparison has to be between a child who's not had a, a implant with a child who's had an implant, not with a child who's had a cochlear implant. So that's that's not a fair comparison. So I think we have done about 53 I think now so far, and uh, one is a division where we have to take out a device which is uh, implanted in the pre-implanted because of uh, a fall. Almost all, all our children are bilateral mishare deformity or cochlear nerve in this year. So what about the outcomes? Uh, again, I just went in great detail, but roughly in six months, nothing much happens. Okay, their, their CAP score goes up to 2 and the uh, SIR score to about 1.5, nothing much. But after a year, it's pick, picked up quite a bit. But then the important thing is it continues to grow. You know, and you need about two to three years of habilitation for a base and implant child as compared to one year for a cochlear implant. So you really need clear counseling preoperatively that this is a long, for a long haul and it's going to be at least a three year habilitation, nothing less. And that's the, that's when you really expect some results to start showing up. Quantity work potentials, uh, this is a team, Ranjit was the uh, first person uh, I think in the, in the whole world to show cortical potentials in ABI and that's a very important evidence that the device is uh, it's not only working but auditory cortical maturation is, is happening as uh, Gunesh said today it's one of the best biomarkers we have today for cortical auditory maturation and we rely quite a bit on that. There's very good correlation between cortical auditory work potentials and the outcomes that we see in this children. Latency in CAP also is, uh, decreases as a function of quality age. Uh, the, 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 coming back to the surgeon's uh, perspective, the flocculus, as I told you, is a villain. And very often we have to dissect out the flocculus to access the area. And that's a bit of a problem because the flocculus is the part of the central limb which is most directly connected to the vestibular nucleus and it's therefore the, the balance part of the and quite a lot of our uh, posture, as we know, maintenance is, is related to the flocculus. It's very, very important for us. So we, uh, our team, we graded the flocculus. We, we never had any classification for that. We graded it into grade one, which is the best grade, where there's virtually no flocculus seen. And there seems to be an inverse relationship between the flocculus and the core plexus. The villain, the you know, other. Where the flocculus is small, the choroidplex is big. So you have to still dissect out the choroidplex, but that's not difficult. So in grade 1, you have a very small flocculus, but you have a very prominent choroidplex. In grade 2, flocculus is hypoplastic uh, with a prominent choroidplex, it's more rostral. Grade 3, the flocculus is still small, but it's more central, and therefore it's hiding the area. And choroidplex is small, and grade 4, you have a huge giant flocculus. So this is just to show you. Here there's no flocculus, but it is agreed as a choroidplexus. 
grade 2, there's a small flocculus, it's called reflexes. See, grade 3, the big flocculus is more central, but the reflex is just rudimentary. And in grade 4, a very large flocculus which we have to really dissect out. So, so in other words, about two thirds of flocculus was, was uh, one and two small, and one third is very big. Which uh, means that in a third of the patients, you're going to have difficulty identifying the location and introducing the uh, implant. So, difficult entry was noted in the last three and four grades. We had to do more retraction of cerebellum, but then we had to even uh, by for a quarter of the flocculus, is quite a frightening thought. But the ninth nerve was always the uh, guide to us. In grade one and two, the entry was easy and uh, yeah, the, I mean, we thought, you know, can we correlate the outcomes with the size of the process? Right? In other words, if it was more easy and it was going to give us a better outcome, no, the answer is no. Unfortunately, there is no correlation between the flocculus grades and the, uh, it just shows that the difficulty the surgeon experiences is related to the flocculus size, nothing more. Looking at the vestibular dysfunction in ABI is very important because some of these children are uh, wobbling after surgery for a few days at least. So they tend to fall. This is important because with the device, if you tend to fall, then you can damage the device. So it's very, very important that you have control over that. So uh, at least about 15% uh, of these children have some vestibular dysfunction. So that is quite an important concentration. And uh, most of them had unsteadiness and uh, at least one child had clear uh, nystagmus with problem. When you look at all these patients with vestibular symptoms, all of them were from the grades 3 and 4, obviously, because we are dissecting out the flocculus and therefore there was every chance that we are causing more trauma. And also the uh, flocculus needed more retraction in these children. And uh, all, if you look at grade 4 patients, almost all of them, uh, or at least uh, 3 out of 5, had the uh, very severe vestibular dysfunction. What about the complications in our series? <laughs> Fortunately, not very many, you know, so far. The important complication is the CSF uh, leak. You can develop a CSF fistula, but fortunately, most of them uh, heal or the wrong. Uh, you have to be very meticulous with your CSF closure in these children. So it's very, very important that we take the precaution. Uh, I think uh, non auditory serious non auditory symptoms uh, have not been any, but Ranjit has had a few patients with some minor non auditory symptoms, and he could identify and stop it. And I have talked about functional NARS today, and uh, Ranjit has had some success with uh, NARS in ABI. Uh, he's shown uh, that uh, you, know, you can actually monitor these children with NARS. So what are the lessons you've learned? It's a difficult surgery, all right, but it's safe in experienced hands. And I think, in my opinion, it's worth the effort. And I think it's very important to be the same rules which we use for the cochlear implant. Uh, you know, uh, we have to use the same criteria for API. So you have to pick them up early and intervene early. So how early is early in ABI? Now, so far, we have, uh, the youngest we have done is about a year and a half, about 18 months. Uh, you know, the anesthetists understandably are a little wary when you start saying, you know, 6 kg or 7 kg baby ABI. So generally, we choose children who are over 8 kilograms. So that's our criteria. Should we consider bilateral implants in the future? I think the answer is yes, but not simultaneous, of course. It has to be sequential. But I think we have to think about bilateral implants in the future in these children. We know that central or India organization does take place in ABI children also because cortical potential show maturation of time. And it's a very good biomarker of cortical maturation. And if you have good CAP, then you can be sure that the outcomes are going to be also pretty good. If you put forth a simple grading of the flawless, it helps the surgeon to predict the difficulty. The advantage is that you can actually assess the proculus preoperatively from the MRI. So you can actually look at the proculus and assess the MRI. So surgeon can be mentally prepared for a difficult situation. A large, more prominent proculus will mean more vestibular disturbance postoperatively. So you have to be careful for so these children then to fall uh, and it may go on for a, up to about a month uh, postoperatively. So you have to be careful about this. Thank you.